Okay. Dear students and all the viewers, most welcome to the final session of today's program. The session is named as Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is given huge importance at heritage. And today, the session will be addressed by one of our very distinguished alumni member who has made the entire heritage family and the entire country really very proud by being featured in Financial Times 100 BAME leaders. We have with us today our own alumni, a student of Applied Electronics and Instrumentation Engineering Department who graduated in the year 2006, Ms. Joita Dash. Most welcome, Joita, in today's program. Thank you before, so before much. Before Joita takes over, let me uh, quickly read out her profile, which I'm actually very much excited to read out her profile for all of you, specifically for the newcomers uh, in this session. Joita, currently the CEO and co-founder of Ghana Limited, is a serial entrepreneur focused on bringing value to deep tech entrepreneurial pursuits by thinking out of the box, identifying market gaps, and rapidly scaling to commercial goals. Customer success and employee welfare are the cornerstones of our entrepreneurial philosophy. And building long-term, sustainable, resilient technology-based value propositions are her speciality. In 2014, she pursued an MBA at Oxford University and was awarded the SAID scholarship. She also received a fellowship for the Entrepreneurship Center and holds a degree in electronics engineering and as well as a degree in physics. Joita started her career as a techie or coder. Joita is a mentor at Oxford University Foundry and also chairs two global women's groups. She has been selected to be a diplomatic representative at the highest levels of international cooperation, such as UK Brazil, UK India, UK Canada, and UK USA trade delegations. She is an Financial Times 100 BAM leader, top 100 in UK tech, ambassador for innovative UK women in innovation, the Indus Entrepreneurs, Thai Women of the Year, KPMG Outpacer, MSD UK Top 3, Edge Tech Rising Star, and has won many other awards. We are indeed looking up to Joita's session in the final hour of today's program. Over to you, Joita. Thank you so much, Sandeep, sir. That was very kind of you. Lots of nice things now that you put it together. <laughs> Not that I deserve all of them, but thank you anyway. Um, thanks, Arvind, sir, for having me here. Um, and uh, the Heritage Group, who's always been a big part of my success. Um, I guess in the end, education is what got me here. So a big, big round of thanks before I begin to everyone who's on this call today or who isn't. The Heritage Group has definitely been a big inspiration for where I am today. So mine is the last session of the day I hear, um, and you guys already had two days of sessions. So I'm thinking you're probably asleep. If you're not, <laughs> grab a coffee or a tea or something, and I hope you're awake. I'll try to make it uh, a bit more interactive so you're not falling asleep. Let's see how it goes. So before I start, I'm going to share my screen, but I, I'll ask all of you a question. I know you can't respond to me, but maybe respond in your homes. How many of you in the audience today, all of you, any of you, has thought that when you go through your education program or when you complete it, you might consider entrepreneurship as a career option? Or even if you've not thought about it, you're thinking, maybe it's one of the things you want to look at. Maybe you want to join an early stage startup. Maybe you want to make your own. So if there's any one of you out there who's right now saying yes or raising your hand, um, maybe my words will especially resonate with you. But if the rest of you who are not thinking you're going to be entrepreneurs, but you want to be innovators, you know, wherever you go, whatever jobs you do, even if it's academia, you're going to have to innovate. And I will talk a little bit about innovation as well. Okay, on that note, let me start. So, right. So we're going to talk a bit about innovation and entrepreneurship. 
I'll probably touch a little bit on generic innovation. Um, I've heard most of you are BTEC and MTEC students, which means whatever you do, you're going to be connected with innovation. And then I'm going to move on a bit with entrepreneurship. And then I will speak a little bit about why I think um, the time that you are in and India being where it is, is very ideal for an entrepreneurial career right now. And if you were thinking about it, what are a few data points you should keep in mind? So a little bit about me, who am I? I think, um, uh, you know, Sandeep sir really gave a really nice introduction. I can't match that. But quickly, a little bit about me. I started out as a techie, um, ended up working in the Silicon Valley. I made a startup, I exited it, I sold it, made another one. Now I'm making a third startup. Um, and now that I'm in my third company, I'm actually a part of lots of other boards as well. Um, I'm part of advisory boards. I advise a couple of um, government organizations. And I also chair a few women's groups um, for technology, education, as well as entrepreneurship. So, so that's a little bit about me. So I wear very different hats. Um, I also have a role where I actually work a bit with universities uh, like Dartmouth in US, which is an Ivy League as well as Oxford. And I try to help the students there move to the next phase. So if you have an idea and you are studying in these universities and you're trying to make a company out of it, then um, I'm kind of one of those fellows who get involved and see if I can help mentor you and take it to the next level. So this is innovation. I think when we talk about the word innovation, what I found, I don't know about all of you, I have personally found that everyone thinks innovation is about making new things, okay? Um, something drastically different and new is about innovation. Um, that's definitely true. But innovation is also about making existing things better. They don't have to be completely new. So I'll give you examples. So there was this group that was working in a very um, hot part of sub-Saharan Africa. And they found that the people who live there, especially the underprivileged and the very poor sections of that society, they live in houses where they cannot afford air conditioning which is true for a lot of India as well, you know? So a lot of hot air would blow into the house and it would get really hot. So this group of students, they had this amazing innovation. They made a, a, a wall curtain, like a blind, you know, that you put against the window, made of thin straws, you know, straws that you get everywhere. And they put the straws next to each other, like they stuck them and they built a wall of straws. So if the air came in, it came through the thin straws and then into the house. Now, because of capillary action, the air got very cold. And so even without air conditioner, when the air would blow outside, the air that got inside the house was colder just by having a straw curtain. That's a great innovation. That's something completely new, completely different. Then your iPhone, if any of you are using your smartphones, you know, 15 years ago, they were a completely different category of things that we've not seen before. So that's definitely innovation. But there are innovation in small things that we don't notice. For instance, the fact that your laptop's getting faster every year because of a better processor is because Intel constantly innovates its chips. So they're not making drastically new chips. They're making the same chips better. And that's also innovation. So when you think of innovation, don't be limited by, I'm going to have to make something completely new, not necessary. You can take existing things and if you make them better for use, for society, for business, for any purpose, then that is innovation. One of the strangest things about innovation that I've learned over time is not making any changes to the product at all, but simply selling it at a time or a place where it's not available. That's innovation. For instance, if you're able to sell ice, just ice, and find a great way of packaging it from the North Pole and bring it to a really hot part of, I don't know, the Gobi Desert, would that count as innovation? I'll leave that question to you. Think about it. 
So innovation isn't always about doing completely different things. It's about improvement as well. And I wanted to say that because I've seen lately this trend that almost all of us want to spend all our entire time on building drastically different things, but we don't want to improve on existing things because we think that's not innovation. So that's a myth that we need to dispel, especially in the tech world, which is where all of you are, that improving things makes a big contribution to human life. Now, how do we go from innovation to a venture? Venture is literally a project or a company. Or if you're working in a company, the fact that you have an idea and you turn it into a project, how does that happen? Or maybe you're studying and you're doing your final years and you have this great idea and you think that this is something that should turn into a startup or an entrepreneurial venture. So how does it work? So first and foremost, I want to dispel this myth that an idea is very precious. Idea is not precious. You can have endless ideas and whoever can execute it is the winner. Okay, so people guard their ideas. They don't want to talk about it. Um, and it's something I've seen a lot in people before they start becoming entrepreneurs. But once they become, you'll realize ideas are worth nothing. Execution is everything. I can sit at home and make this great plan to have a balloon that will go over the world. It's all in my head. It makes no sense. I can have a million ideas and die with it. Unless you're executing and implementing it, ideas are not worth commercial value, not legally, not financially. So if you have great ideas and you're not discussing them, even though you're thinking of a startup because someone will steal your idea, it doesn't work like that. If you think of the smartphones that we all have, iPhone, the first smartphone pretty much came from, you know, this touch screen came from Apple, but then obviously Samsung is also making them. And now everyone makes iPhones, but still the best ones come from Apple or some would say some best Android brands. So the idea is the same, but they've all implemented and executed is drastically differently. So idea doesn't have as much value as your implementation. Now don't confuse between idea and intellectual property. When you study engineering or you get into your BTEC or MTEC, you might intentionally or accidentally work on projects that have very valuable intellectual property. You know, you've created something valuable, like an algorithm or a discovery. That is valuable. You can patent it and you can keep it to yourself until you decide to sell it. But in general, you know the idea that there should be better home delivery or I have the idea of a better car. Don't be worried about sharing them. The most important thing is who's going to take that idea and make the best version out of it. That's more important than um, just thinking about it and being very secretive about it. So once you have the idea, it's very important that this innovation that you're thinking, you're able to think of how you're going to commercialize it, right? Whenever you think of anything, any business, any entrepreneurship, anything to do with startups, it's very clear that you have to have some way of making money, right? You, you can't just do it for nothing. So there has to be a way of making money. So here is your idea. Here is the innovation that you're working on. And here is the business that you want to make. The bridge is how are you going to make money out of it, right? I'll give you an example. So let's say you've made a website where everyone's going to post a review of their favorite book. Great idea. How are you going to commercialize it? Who pays for it? The person who's writing the reviews? Or everybody writes for free? People who read the reviews pay for it? Or no one pays for it, neither the writer nor the reader. But, you know, a big publisher is paying for advertisements, like Facebook. No one pays. So you have to find a way of how exactly is this venture going to make money? Once you figure that out, you have the last step, which is, this is worthy of being a venture. It's innovation, it's commercialization, and now it can turn into a venture. Then it's time to start thinking of how are you gonna start making it? Now, different countries deal with it differently. Um, countries like America, especially West Coast, 
they don't think about commercialization on day one because they have huge funding rounds. They are happy to wait until you know, you're well developed enough to think about how you're going to make money. Whereas in Europe or Asia, or I think India, people would like you to think about how you're going to commercialize things on day one. Um, but why are we talking about entrepreneurship? Why is it important? Why, you know, can we talk about something else? Like, you know, you can just simply place a lot of emphasis on innovation alone. Why are we talking about innovation plus commercialization, doing all these painful things to be entrepreneurs? Well, lots of people will tell you <laughs> entrepreneurship is important because entrepreneurs have big egos. We like to be big bosses. That's, that's also probably true for a lot of people. I'm sure some of us have really big egos and we are terrible human beings. Entrepreneurs can be quite awful, I promise you that. Uh, I might be one of them, I don't know. <laughs> you have to ask my husband, he probably knows the best version. Um, but entrepreneurs definitely don't always do it for their egos. If they do, I don't know how long they last. I think the main reasons that entrepreneurship is really important is not personal. One, uh, entrepreneurship creates jobs. When you create a new venture and you have based it on the back of innovation, there is the potential to recruit people, give people more jobs. And once you give people more jobs and your venture starts making money, you're boosting the economy. So the economy becomes better because you're bringing in revenue right? You have found a way to make money. And when you do that inside whatever country you're doing, they start doing better. That happens. And the third and the most important thing is when you have new things coming up that are very successful, it makes your nation very proud. So let's think of a really good brand right now that is making the world proud and think of the country it came from, how proud they must be that it originated there, right? We're very proud of a lot of things we made. I personally like the brand Fab India in India, it's really great. I think they're amazing. And it's amazing that India could bring that up. There is Biocon, which is led by Kiran Mazumdar Shah. It's a huge biotech company that was set up by an Indian woman 25, 30 years ago. And it's a fabulous thing that the country did. I'm sure America is very proud of Apple. I'm sure Korea is very proud of Samsung. Um, so when you build something of value within a nation, you bring a lot of pride to it. So obviously entrepreneurship does three very amazing things. And because of these reasons, this is a good time to do it in India. You obviously need more jobs because India will have the largest number of young people by 2030. In 2030, the average age of people in India will be 31, the youngest in the world, whereas most of the world will be 45. So you're going to have the largest number of youth. If you're gonna have so many young people, they're gonna need jobs and they're gonna need skills. So if you build ventures that employ people, that's a good thing to do. Also, obviously you're going to boost the economy, which we badly need, especially post COVID, you really need it. And finally, national pride. I'm not very political, so I haven't chosen a side, but I know that there is a lot of turbulence right now in the country between you know, different sides picking different things. But if you have a unifying thing, like a great venture or a great brand that comes out of the country, it could be very unifying. And it doesn't even have to be a great brand. Even if it's a small thing in a small town that employs 10 people, that's 10 people who will get salaries to run their homes, which is great. So um, to me personally, entrepreneurship is a great tool that changes everything. This is the current Indian startup scenario. India is doing really, really well. Um, it's competing with the rest of the world when it comes to startups and ventures. Last year, the country raised 3.4 billion for 194 startups who were able to raise these funds. And the amazing thing is this is very comparable to some of the most developed nations. So India is doing extremely well when it comes to startups in the last three years, especially since 2017. So this is a good time to be an entrepreneur there. The most amazing thing for me was I, was, I looked at this number and I was like, 
who are the people who are funding so much? You know, who's giving so much money to India? Who are these people? And when I found the VCs, the venture capitalists who fund India, I was amazed that the top 10 names were the best venture capitalists in the world. So they fund San Francisco and Silicon Valley, and they also fund India. How great is that? That means we are literally, you know, coming up neck to neck with some of the biggest names. These are two of my really favorite entrepreneurs. I thought I'll give you some names to think about. Um, on the left is Ritesh Agarwal of Oyo Rooms, right? He was a really young guy who dropped out of, uh, I think, college. Yes, he dropped out of college and then he built this brand. I'm not asking you to drop out, by the way, <laughs> but this is what he did. Um, and he built this uh, great company called Oyo on your own. They're, they have rooms everywhere. Then on your right is Kiran Mazumdar Shah, extremely educated and very, very intelligent lady. She built this pharmaceutical company called Biocon, um, which if you look up, is one of the best uh, pharmaceutical brands in the world and is possibly one of the best companies India has made. In addition to that, there are many others. There's Vipro that was set up by Azim Premji. There's, uh, we all know Narayan Murthy who set up Infosys. So there are lots of top class Indian entrepreneurs, uh, Ratan Tata, uh, of course the money families, but they're a bit generational now. Um, these are all great companies that came out, of this uh, came out of this country, but I particularly like to bring up Ritesh because he's a, a younger entrepreneur. It's not family money and he did it on his own despite being a college dropout. So these are the VCs I was telling you about. Some of the top brands in the world actually fund India. Sequoia Cap, which is based out of US um, and is now in India as well. Axel, Tiger. Tiger, I think their headquarters are in New York. Um, and then a bunch of others. Lightspeed, which is a huge fund. Uh, and you can see the number of deals they did um, in 2019 in the second column. And in the third column, you have some famous startups that they have invested in. So Sakura invested in Vimo, Pocket, Aces, Office. Um, uh, what are some famous names? Uh, Omidyar Network invested in Yellow, Lightspeed invested in ShareChat, um, Kirate Ventures invested in Emotix and PlayShifu. So that's just 2019 alone. Um, so you can obviously see that it's a great booming economy for entrepreneurship. And you're in India starting a brand new career. You can certainly think about doing new things that haven't been done before. And there's a good chance that you could actually find the capital to, to make, make your dreams a reality. These are some really fast growing Indian startups. I thought I'll just bring them up. I think you all know about Zomato and Squiggy and people like that. Uh, Shuttle, Ola Cabs. Ola Cabs is not global. So they started in India, they did very well. And now I see them in Europe and UK and they're competing with the brands here, which is great, but they started out there. Uh, FinTech has a lot of things like Paytm and um, I keep seeing lots of new names in FinTech as well. So there are lots of fast growing Indian startups and they're just scaling like crazy. Now I want to talk a bit about the social impact. So these were all, you know, entrepreneurs and innovation, which was purely about benefiting people but they are about making decent amount of revenue. They're all about making money, right? But what if you want to also do something that has a big impact on the social and the economic structure of the most dependent and needy parts of India? As we know, there's still about, you know, eight to 9% that lives below the poverty line. And when you talk of a country of 1.2 billion people, that's a lot of poor people. Um, if you walk around any city, you can see the amount of people that don't have enough privileges. Um, I, uh, I myself was very, very involved in social entrepreneurship when I lived in India, even as a child. Um, 
my mother used to make me do it every Sunday um, and every birthday. And so I've spent my entire life volunteering for uh, missionaries of charity, for CRY, for WHO. I used to work with the local youth association. Um, I used to work for a lot of disaster relief, even when I was 10 years old. And so I have seen this uh, sector very closely. I actually ended up making a nonprofit called Anahata Life about seven years ago in Bangalore that used to work with children who are stuck in very complicated um, situations, especially in slum areas. Um, and I made that nonprofit entirely with my own money, which wasn't a lot. Um, so I basically made a little bit of money working in the Silicon Valley, et cetera. And then I saved it and I made this nonprofit and I invested all of it back to the community and uh, went back to zero and decided to make another company, which is what I'm doing now. Um, but when I did that, I, I, I didn't regret it for a single day. I don't regret spending all of it. Um, it was amazing. It was great to get so close to the grassroots community and to see their problems firsthand and to be able to contribute. We were able to sponsor 118 children to go for higher education. We were able to help more than 60 women to leave um, very terrible domestic abuse situations. And I found that it's a very fulfilling activity. Um, and at some point in the near future, I'm pretty sure I'll go back to making um, a venture like that again. So uh, social impact is something that we really, really need. Um, and I think that if this is an area that you're trying to think of using your brains and intelligence or energy for, then th that's a great way to go. That's a great way to go. So I want to talk about a few big challenges. Um, so in the World Economic Forum last year, uh, India and um, the Welfare Ministry brought up a couple of big challenges. I was there. I, I actually went to the World Economic Forum. Um, one of the things was obviously socioeconomic inclusion of rural India. So India, the, India presented to the World Economic Forum that one of the important things that we need to solve is to be able to give opportunities to rural India. So the people in the villages are not left behind. And as you know, we barely have like 40 big cities. I mean, the entire country lives in rural India. India lives in villages, as someone said. So we need to be able to include everyone. Um, the second one is skills and employment, um, because as I discussed, by 2030, the largest number of youth in the world will live in India, which means skills and employment are a really important thing to do. Because if you have young people, they need jobs. All of you need jobs, right? When you do your BTEC or MTEC or whatever, you're going to have to get jobs. There should be enough skills and enough jobs. Uh, finally, health and sustainability. Um, and this is mainly coming from the pollution and the lack of disregard for the environment. India currently houses some of the world's most polluted cities, Delhi, Calcutta, Hyderabad, et cetera, uh, Chennai. And also most importantly, there's a lot of sustainability issues because India hasn't invested a lot of time and effort on environmental regulations or enforcing them. The roads are full of dirt and dust, which gives rise to diseases. That's why it's health and sustainability, health. Um, the, the lakes and the rivers are full of trash, which obviously kills all marine life and plants, which in turn disrupts the entire food circle. And so, so these are the three really important things that we need to solve. So how are, how are you gonna solve this as a country? You can't just solve it by asking the government to make policies. A great way to solve it is to make ventures, is to make social impact enterprises that will actually solve these problems. And that's a great way to use innovation. So let's look a bit into the various ways you can get into solving these problems with innovation and entrepreneurship. This is a really good startup in 2006 they did and they're still going very well. Uh, it's called Rangde and uh, the people on the right are the founders, Smitha and Ram. They're they're two amazing people. I've actually followed them for over 14 years and it's a big favorite of mine. So what Rangde does is so in 2006, Muhammad Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize. He's from Bangladesh. Muhammad Yunus invented this really nice way to fund uh, 
poor people in villages who have skills. So you can invest a very small amount of money, like even 10 rupees or 100 rupees. And that goes to someone who's trying to repair a rickshaw or making a better fruit stall or making um, you know, something by the roadside. And when they are able to repay in six months, you get two rupees back as an interest on your 100 rupees. So it's not for free. You get something back and they get their uh, livelihood. It's called microfinance. And it's uh, it's a principle that Muhammad Yunus came up with and he won the Nobel Peace Prize for it. So Smita and Ram were very inspired by this and they started Rangde in 2006. Um, and it's it's a fabulous crowdfunding platform. I've donated to Rangde all my life. You basically go there, you pick someone who's working on some small project or who's making a small shop or, or a rickshaw or something and you give them a small amount of money that helps them solve their problem and you also get a return on interest every six months. So this is a fabulous way how innovation in finance and internet and web payment has solved a grassroots economic problem. Another one is uh, Ranga Sutra. This is uh, this is done by a lady called Sumita Ghosh. It's, it's, uh, it's a wonderful organization. Um, so I guess all of you are in India right now. I don't know how much you've traveled abroad or even if you have, if you've noticed these things, but I'm getting older and I and I live uh, you know, abroad for like, I don't know how long I left the country so long ago. I noticed that one of the most wonderful things about Indian art is fabric. You know, what we wear here is just plain. It's just like knitted. But India has beautiful fabric, you know, the Banarasi, the silk, the Khadi, the linen, the bamboo. It's, it's incredible. It's handwoven. It's embroidered. It's a disappearing art form uh, because obviously everyone wants to wear denims, which is fine. But what happens is these people are losing their livelihood and you're losing art forms. A hundred years from now, maybe there'll be no one who will know how to make a, you know, gachola, sorry. Um, so this lady has set up this organization where basically they have rural artisans across India who are in villages making authentic Indian art form fabrics and then she sells it to across the world so people like us can actually order it in whatever country we live in. Um, so it gives livelihood to those people and it helps us rediscover Indian art and it helps Indian heritage go forward which is amazing. So you can see their mantra. They say our values we act as a bridge between rural artisans and global consumers in order to develop sustainable livelihoods and revive India's rich craft heritage. So Ranga Sutra is a great way of socioeconomic inclusion, skills and employment, uh, both of those priorities being met by a great innovative business model. What's the innovation here? They're not making new saris that you have never seen before, right? The innovation here is the model with which they have approached the business. So you can see, you can have all types of innovation. It doesn't have to be a new product. This is the third one that I wanted to mention, Frontier Markets by Ajayita Shah. It's also a fabulous uh, organization in India where what they've done is, uh, the, this company is run by more than 50% women, which is a huge statistics in India. So what they do is they work with all households in rural India and give them solar powered lights especially reusable, renewable lights, because lights are what empowers their children to study at night, to cook, to go to the toilet. It helps them reach the last goal, health and sustainability, as well as um, skills and employment. Um, and they do that with various approaches. So you can look them up. Um, so these are some of the social impact entrepreneurships. I know we're only going to talk of the Intels and Apples and Samsungs of the world, but uh, because I'm also an engineer like you, but I also wanted to bring to your radar that it's possible to contribute your brain in many other models as well. Anyway, um, that's really all I had um, from my side about innovation and entrepreneurship. I think it'd be really exciting to hear if you all have questions and if I can answer something for you. You're on mute, Sandeep. Uh, very, very enriching presentation, Jyotika. 
uh, yes, you, you, you showed actually the right way of how to connect innovation and entrepreneurship together. It's fascinating. Meanwhile, to all the viewers, if you want to, I have already received some of the questions. If you want to send any question, then the email ID is questions at heritageit.edu. So you can send your questions. So uh, if Joita has some time, I can ask some of the questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, which I have received. Uh, it's a very cliche one, but still I would like to hear from you. Can entrepreneurship be taught? Mm, so part of it, yes. Part of it, no. Um, but I think that's true for anything. If you're going to be a fabulous singer, they can teach you the notes and the pitch practice, but how much you love it, how much of your life you're going to give up to be the best singer is totally up to you. Um, so I think entrepreneurship is like that. The only difference is in any other profession, just the teaching part can take you 80%. And then it's up to you if you do the last 20% and become the best or not. Whereas entrepreneurship, the teaching part is probably 40%. So 60% is your own. Um, and so if you don't have that, you won't make it. So that's the difference. But it doesn't look very different from anything else where uh, people think entrepreneurship is a bit like art. You know, Steve Jobs was born like an entrepreneur. Maybe he was. He did build a $3 trillion company that none of us did. But let's face it, if you read about it, think about it, talk to friends who are entrepreneurs, learn business models, work really hard, sacrifice, learn the basic principles, become robust, then, you know, why not? Maybe it won't be Apple, but it can still be a good business. True, true, true. Uh, the second one is, yeah, this is uh, interesting from the perspective of students. What is the right time for one to start his or her own venture? <laughs> uh, so how long is a piece of string? <laughs> What's the answer? <laughs> it can be anything. Um, <laughs> So actually, India right now has an amazing record. There are a bunch of entrepreneurs in India less than the age of 15. The most uh, well-profiting website is run by two brothers, 10 and 12-year-old. So there are 10 and 10-year-old, 12-year-old entrepreneurs living out of Bangalore who make websites. And then I have friends who are 50 and 60. KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, was set up by a gentleman who was almost 80 when he set it up. And it's a huge brand now in the world. Um, McDonald's, the whole franchisee model was done by a gentleman who was 65. And until that time, he had done nothing remarkable in life. Nothing. Very average guy, retired, depressed. At 65, he just thought, let's do something. And then there are 10-year-olds. So I think there is no time. Um, the only thing I will say is... So this is a bit controversial. I know most people will say entrepreneurship is taking a chance and whenever you're ready, you jump for it. I don't really say that because I've seen that the cost of entrepreneurship is a lot to your family because you don't obviously make decent amount of money for a long time and you work really hard, seven days a week. There's no holiday, there's no weekend, your health suffers, you don't have time for your kids. It's, it's a hard life, you know, my, my family definitely paid a price, every family does. I think it's really important to not be very selfish. You know, if you are going through a time when someone in your family is very sick or needs you, or a particular child is going through a terrible time, or uh, your parents are in some sort of a huge financial crisis, maybe it's not the best time to think about, well, not just entrepreneurship, anything very selfish, right? So I know that's not what is said in books. They're gonna say, just jump when you're ready. But I would say, be a little compassionate, think about your family, they're gonna pay the price. And if they're in a very vulnerable position, maybe wait a bit, a year or two, save up and then do it. Um, but of course, it's like singing. Something in you is killing you. You want to do it. You love it so much. You can't think of anything else. Then, of course, just do it. Yeah. Yeah, true. When you are bootstrapping, I think the family is the only only place where you can yeah. it. So the next one is, uh, yeah, uh, this is interesting. What are the key points one should keep in mind while pitching an idea in front of an investor or say any funding agency? Yeah, so the first thing is even before steps, I'd say place yourself as an investor, okay? If you were listening to yourself, why would you give yourself money? 
so if you walk into a store and you're trying to buy a refrigerator and you're looking at various models, okay, why do you part with your money ultimately? What persuades you? You're going to have to think like that because these guys hear pictures every day. So you're another refrigerator. Why would he buy you? So what differentiates you is important. But also, if in the pitch you haven't in some way managed to convey in a very short time why there will be a return on the investment, then there is no way for them to invest. Like what I mean is, if someone's going to give you a thousand rupees, let's say, I mean, it's much more, but let's say a thousand rupees, they are expecting at least 20,000, right? So you have to do something with that thousand that makes it 20,000. And in your head, anything interesting will make it 20,000. But think about it. If you have that money, will you just give it to someone without knowing exactly how they're going to do it? So be a little bit more specific about how you're going to provide the return on interest. So this is the money I need. This is what I'm going to do with it. And this is the amount of return it could generate for you in so many years. If you don't include this somewhere in your pitch, then you leave it to the other person to imagine. They may do it for you or they may not do it. Depends on how much they like you. Uh, that's one very important thing. Drawing a very clear, obvious line, make it easy for them to understand how their money will be amplified. Uh, but I also think that another important thing while pitching is making it interesting in any way. Don't just go with the run of the mill pitches. This is my business, this is my idea. This is the thing. They hear that all the time. What's interesting? What is so personal about it? Why would you give up your life and time to make it? Why does it touch you? use that story. That's really important. Um, and the third and the most important thing is don't make it too long. Make it short and then answer questions. Because when you speak for a very long time, <laughs> as all of you know, in your classes and lectures, you are not listening. You switch off after 30 seconds. You get a person's attention for 30 seconds. So get their attention, then stop and say, what questions can I answer? Shweta, you are you are actually building uh, ventures. You are you are you are into ventures, uh, say for the past ten years, uh, maybe uh, uh, more than ten years. So, do you find any any change in in perspective uh, uh, during this ten years uh, of of the society and uh, of 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 uh, say people around you? The change in perspective or or regarding per, uh, on entrepreneurship earlier, I can. Yeah. I can remember if you say that in, in specifically in Indian society, if you say I'll quit the job and, and, and I'll start a coffee shop, maybe. The yeah. first thing is that uh, your parents might start beating you. Yes, yes. It happened to me. It happened to me. <laughs> so, so my family it was shocked in 2008. Okay. Um, and first of all, there weren't so many women in business back then, especially not in tech. Um, and my family is a very standard, you know, working middle class family where everyone has jobs and salaries and steady lives. And I just suddenly told my uncles and my mom, you know, I'm just going to be an entrepreneur. And they're like, you're going to be what? <laughs> I'm going to be an entrepreneur. What does it mean? <laughs> I'm going to make this business. And she's like, have you lost your mind? You have a great job. <laughs> You're an engineer. Why do you want to make business? It was almost like embarrassing for them that I would try to do something like that. Um, and, um, and I think that we associate business with very few communities in India where we think they are good to do business, but the rest of us shouldn't try it. So I, I got that same advice. Like, you're not ABC or whatever, and you're not going to be able to make a business. Um, so one thing I've seen is that's changed. Like people are trying it. Um, and although I don't live there anymore, I definitely see all my Indian friends trying different things on the side. So the perception has opened up. The second thing that has changed is I've seen a lot more women. Um, so in 2008, it was shocking. Like I would walk into a room and say, I'm trying to run a business. Everyone would be like, What's this young girl talking about? <laughs> Has she lost her mind? <laughs> like, but now there's lots of young women in last 12, 13 years, which is great, um, that, that are trying to do. I think the third thing, which I think might have led to these changes, is the way the government and the funding sources look at new business. In India earlier, other than bank loans, you couldn't have gotten funding. And bank loans are on the basis of big collaterals like houses and stuff that young people don't have. 
you don't have a massive house to pledge at the age of 20, right? So you couldn't have made a business unless your dad was very rich, which was generational businesses like the Ambani's. Um, so what has changed is now people do give you these loans, uh, unsecured loans and collateral free loans. Now you get VCs that I showed that are investing in you for no collateral and government policies that are encouraging people to invest. So as long as capital is available easily, more people will do it. As more people will do it, supply and demand, your families will start to accept it. It'll become normal. So definitely saw that. Okay. Uh, uh, the next one, uh, okay, uh, the next one, uh, I would like to ask you one question. Uh, I would love to hear some of your memories of your heritage days. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> For most 14 years, <laughs> if you <laughs> have anything specific in your <laughs> mind. <laughs> um. I wasn't that great a kid as, you, as you'd like to think. <laughs> uh, I definitely wasn't that good, I promised you that. Um, I have to say, for me, one thing that was happening, which will happen to everyone in this batch or any heritage batch anywhere is, while you're doing it, you don't value it, you just think it's a great time. But once it's over, you get out in the world and you recognize it was an incredible four years. Opportunity to be with hundreds of amazing peers, to be surrounded by professors of various discipline, to be immersed in creating tech without thinking of paying the rent or the bills at home, which is what will happen four years from now, is amazing. Those, you know, the student life is amazing. You're not thinking how you're going to make rent or, you know, what you're going to do with your partner this holiday, how much you have to spend. <laughs> you have, you're entirely focused on your studies, which is great. Um, and, I, and I think that I didn't value it as much. No student does when they're it. Um, I'll tell you my experiences. Heritage back then was a little bit smaller than it is now. So there was a lot of space. So we used that space well. I think once I did something a bit crazy, I found little puppy dogs and <laughs> I love animals. So I put them in my bag and I tried to get into class and sit in the corner with my puppy, but it started yelping. <laughs> and then I think so, the professor, um, was uh, it was mechanical. So the, I, I remember who it was uh, and he just said like, there's a sound of a puppy in the class. <laughs> and I was like, nope, I don't know. I'm in the front row and I'm saying no. And he's like, it's definitely coming from your bag. So, <laughs> and then it turned out I had two puppy dogs in my bag. Um, so that was very interesting. And the second thing I'll say is I made amazing friends where not everyone is in touch because it's a huge batch, but a few are. Um, and I have to say, I'm very proud of seeing where everyone's been. 10, 15 years down the line, everybody's doing something interesting or amazing. I haven't seen anybody who I met and I said, oh, he was in heritage with me and look at him or her, he's not doing anything. It's, it's everybody's something interesting. Somebody did it in one year, someone took six years, someone took 10 years, but they're doing amazing things, the entire batch, uh, which is the second thing I'll say. The third experience I had was, I saw it grow right in front of me, which was amazing. Like even in the four or five years that I spent there, new buildings, new departments. So heritage for me is an example of a great venture itself. You know, something that's expanding, that's growing. Um, and it's exactly what we talked about. It's creating jobs, it's providing skills and employment. Um, it's literally adding to the national pride. So, so that's amazing. So my last question, uh, as a senior, three things that you'd like to tell your juniors. You can. You can, you can completely forget our presence. It's a senior versus junior <laughs> discussion. It can be like that. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I'd say don't take too much advice like I'm about to give. Just do your thing. I, I, I never took a lot of advice, and I think it's okay to do that. Um, okay, jokes apart. The first thing I'd say is uh, you're going to have a lot of fun, personally and professionally. You'll go to festivals, you'll meet people, you'll make new girlfriends and boyfriends, you'll break up with them, you'll make another set, and it goes on, okay? Um, and it's all fun. It's fine. Um, don't let yourself feel guilty. You're 18 or 19 or 20. You're not going to be saints. You're definitely going to like people. You're definitely going to have emotions. But 
that should not absolve you from delivering what you're there to deliver, okay? Uh, you don't just have hormones, you also have a brain. You have everything. So the hormones will do their job, your heart will do its job, but the brain's also got to do its job. If you're a human being, you don't just have hands, you also have legs, right? So use everything, use your heart, enjoy, have all those, uh, you know, exposures to emotional relationships and, you know, texting to someone and breaking up and crying. That's part of being a grown up, but also don't undermine your brain. It's supposed to do its job as well. So get through your education with what you need out of it. You should have an idea, maybe not in the first year. First year, you're exploring different disciplines. You're getting your foothold. By second year, or at least third year, you should be very clear. What do you want out of this degree? Are you looking for a job placement immediately? Do you want to try a startup? Are you looking for a master's? Are you looking to go abroad? Are you going to sit for SAT? Have a plan. You don't need it in the year one, exploratory. But year two and three have a plan. So do all your emotional things. That's perfectly fine. But also use your brains because you are made of many organs, not just your heart. That's one. The second thing I'd say is the most undermined asset where you'll study are your professors. They're amazing. They know things that you will never know. Okay. They're going to tell you things that you won't like. <laughs> They'll probably scold you. They'll probably ask you to do things you don't like. None of us like our parents when we are 20, but we love them when we are 30. Okay. So you're not going to value them now because they will be restrictive. But you're never going to be in a place in your life where for four years you're surrounded by people where everyone is very good at what they do. This won't happen again. You can go to jobs, entrepreneurship, whatever. You're never going to get 200 incredibly educated people waiting for you. This won't happen again in life. So not just classes, get to know them beyond classes. I spent some time with a few more professors and I actually would ask them, what did they study? Where did they go? What additional books can they recommend? What do they think of certain professions? Get to know them and use their knowledge. They're very, very knowledgeable, educated, intelligent people who are waiting to help you. So ask for help, okay? Beyond your personal feelings for them, ask for help. You may be angry, but what they said yesterday, that's fine. Still ask for help. And the third thing I'll say is um, you'll be very tempted to break rules all the time because that's just how we are human beings, you know, 18 to 25, you just don't want to, you put a barrier, you want to break it. I get it. I did it a lot. I promise you. That's what made me an entrepreneur. So I don't judge it. <laughs> it's fine. But ask this question in the end, you are spending time and money. I don't know if you paid, your parents paid, somebody did, and it's also time. You're not going to get this time again in your life. So whatever you do, it could be great breaking those barriers and those rules, and you should probably do some of them. I also bunked a few classes, did a few stupid things. But ask yourself, is this really benefiting you? Because you're not going to be 22 again, ever. That's just once in your life. So there should be some sort of a benefit. Um, if there's no benefit and you're doing it purely for fun, that's fine. Sometimes fun is good. But every time, if the answer is fun, then something isn't right. Sometimes the answer should be fun. Why am I doing this? Fun. Good answer. But if you always hear fun, 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 you're above 18. You're an adult. <laughs> Adults don't always do things for fun. They do things for benefit. If you're doing everything for fun for four years, then you are acting a bit like a child. So, so these three balances, do everything, have fun, use your heart, but also use your brains and really use your professors because you won't get them again and have a plan by the time you're in year two or three. Dwita, just received a few more questions. If you have time, then of course, I'll yeah. put them across. <laughs> Uh, mm, one question is how to get your first client or customer? Yeah, the first customer is really hard because you don't have anything to back up your claim for. So there are only two ways to get it. You have to either do something outrageous, like give it for free. Like you convince this person, be very honest and say, you are the first customer. So I know this is not going to be perfect. It will be imperfect. Therefore, it is free. Can you still use it and give me feedback? Because what you need is feedback. Feedback is way more important than revenue for the first few customers. You can make revenue rest of your life 
but feedback is most important. So try to give it for free or provide something that they will never get. Like uh, if you do this, then we will also do this for you. Make something so interesting that they know honestly, that they're your first customer, but they'll still do it because you've offered something for it. Um, I like to be honest. I don't like to tell people I had 200 customers before because it's not true. I think honesty is the best policy. So speak the truth that you are helping me out, but this is what I will do for you. Uh, the second way to get it is friends and family. That doesn't mean you have to come from a huge family with great contacts. I didn't, but um, they still know people. For instance, you know, your uncle works in a factory. You go to that uncle every day, annoy him. Can I please get an introduction to your boss for trialing my software? Your uncle's like, I'm never going to do it. Don't waste my time. This is my career. Send him a box of sweets, <laughs> you know, whatever. Do what it takes to get a referral from your friends and family, because usually that's a very good route. When someone refers you to somebody, they tend to do a favor. Uh, so friends and family and offering things that are like free, Another question is, uh, how to overcome failure in business? Ooh, so, so you mean like inside the business or if the business has failed? Maybe the, if the business has failed, yeah, if okay. one of your ventures has, yeah. has failed. It will happen a lot. Like uh, I had like two, three side failed ventures, although I have three successful. Uh, you will fail a lot and you probably should. Even if you're succeeding inside the business, you should fail all the time. Because if you are doing something that has been done before and there is an instruction set available, then that's not a business because it's already done, right? They're already making money, whoever it is. So it's not new. If you are doing it and it's not been done before in that way, obviously it's a completely new set of instructions which means you will fail. In fact, 99% of the time you will try something and you will fail. So the first thing you need to be an entrepreneur is very thick skin. It doesn't matter what people tell you, who writes a bad tweet, who embarrasses you. Customers will hate you probably the first few iterations. You should see the first few customer reviews of like Slack or Notion. Even today, after five years, I sometimes see Apple reviews that'll make you cry. Like, Dear Apple, can you disappear from the planet because you are crap? So <laughs> develop thick skin, you will fail for sure when it comes to product, business, everything. But if you want to make the venture, eventually, even if many businesses have failed, they will fail. You have to have very thick skin. Um, and you really don't, you really have to reach a point in life where public opinion doesn't matter. Because once you fail, people will judge you. I know it's great to say society should change. They shouldn't judge. Human beings are human beings. Failure is judged everywhere in the world. That's just how life is. They will judge you. So don't ask human beings to change their nature. You change yourself. If they judge you that you failed, whatever, move on. Have a thick skin. But failure is inevitable. In fact, if you're not failing quite a bit inside your venture or outside, it's usually said it's not a good venture because that means you're trying something you know very well and you're very comfortable, which means somebody else in the world is also very comfortable. So failure is a very good sign that you're in a good venture. That's great, Joita. That's great. Uh, almost one hour. It's, it's, it's been very nice talking to you. I enjoyed a lot mm -hmm. this session. And I, I hope that all, all the students who are, who are uh, viewing this session must have got some very valuable input from your discussions. So um, on behalf of the entire Heritage family, your family back here, I wish you every success in all your future endeavors. And on our behalf, wish you all the best. All Thank the best. Thank you so much for, for having me. Ventures. And good luck to all the students. Have this amazing time of your life that's not going to come back. Have a lot of fun and make us all very proud. Whether grades or ventures or whatever you do, become amazing at what you do. And that's going to make us all very proud. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, our session. Happy Diwali, if you can wish that. Yes, happy Diwali. <laughs> yes, happy Diwali. It's quite festive.